Hello, welcome to the I'm Excited Podcast. I am your host, David Hicks. Whether you're watching or listening, thank you so much for doing so. Uh, I am humbled and honored that you would, and I hope this will be a fantastic blessing for you and that you'll be able to take that blessing and share it with others. We've been talking about the big picture of life. What's the story of humanity? When, as, as presented in the Bible, the collection of writings throughout history that were guided by the Holy Spirit, by God. And so when you put all this together, what is our story? And so I'll try and briefly recap part one as quick as I can in order to be able to get to all the new material that we want to cover in this video, in this podcast, uh, part two. But the major points were this. We were created by God, by Jesus, and by the Holy Spirit. God the Father, Jesus' Son, the Holy Spirit is in utmost uh, connection, relationship with God and with Jesus. So they came together to create us. They created us in their image. And so a primary way then to think of our relationship, especially with God the Father, is that a family? Is that of God being our Father and we are his children? It's a child-parent relationship. And not just any child-parent relationship. Our parent, our Father, has the deepest of loves for us as his children, as his creation and the sacrifices that he has made and the sacrifices that Jesus have made through the years will demonstrate their deep love for us, their creation. And so when they created us, they gave us the freedom to choose between obedience and disobedience. And now we have the the power to choose between good and evil. The problem with that being, okay, how shall I say? The the part that's not a problem with that is that that's what love does. Love grants freedom. And so God in his love for us, not going to force us to always do what's right. He's going to sit back and give us freedom. Let us choose whether or not we're going to trust him. Are we going to trust him or not? And so we have the power to choose. When we don't trust him, that's when we are choosing our own ways. We're choosing evil. We're choosing to either do wrong or we're refusing to do what's right. But yes, God has granted us freedom. And we have to choose whether or not we'll trust him. Now, God's desire is to be in an eternal relationship with us. He uh, of he himself is eternal, and being our loving Father, it makes sense. He'd always want to be in relationship with his children. If, if you are a parent who loves your child, who has children and loves them, you know that you, they're never. There's not a time in your life where you want them to be completely set, cut off from you. That you never communicate, you never talk, you never hear from them again. No, you want to stay in connection with your child, and so that's the way God is with us. And God, being eternal, wants us also to be in eternal relationship with Him. And He plans, by the way. In order to to make this happen, part of his plan is that he's going to make a whole new creation. This one is messed up. We all hurt because of it. We all suffer because of it. I hope to in the next podcast or at least two podcasts down from now to give you a visual that might help you endure the suffering of this life. It's helped me a lot, so I hope to share that with you. But yes, this, this life is messed up. And mainly because of the evil that is in it, because of how we so often choose to rebel and go our own way instead of doing what God wants, or we just don't do things that he tells us to do. Feed the hungry, 
for example. We refuse to do that. People go hungry and they suffer. We do what God tells us to do. Less people go hungry. Less people suffer. But yes, he is planning to make a new creation and it will have none of the things that make this life so bad. No death, no pain, no suffering. He's taking it all away and he's going to heal us of the spiritual, emotional hurt that we have accrued in this life. He's going to take all that pain away. Now, in order for us to be a part of that plan, a part of that new creation that he, he's going to make, going to wipe this out, throw it away, going to make something new. If we want to be a part of that, we have to choose to trust him. He's not going to let us be in eternal relationship with him if we don't trust him. If we're going to live by our ways instead of his, it, it just, it won't work. Because what will happen is we will bring pain and suffering into this new world that he's creating. Because we will bring our own ways, we will bring evil then, wrongdoing, into that new creation. He's not going to have it. So we have to choose to trust him. The second thing is somebody has to take the punishment for our wrongdoings. Because the next step after this life is to be punished for what we've done wrong, for the, the good that we refuse to do, etc. And so for us to kind of skip that part, shall we say, somebody has to step in and take our punishment for us. That is what Jesus did. Jesus was in heaven with God. Don't have enough time to get into this part of their relationship, but he was equal with God. He was just as much God as God is God. But Jesus chose to become God's son. Chose to become God's son. He became human, born of the Virgin Mary, formed in Mary by the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit. He was the son of God and yet human. He lived a a life of full of suffering. He was called a man of sorrows by the prophet Isaiah. And he began his ministry. He did his ministry. At the end of his ministry, he was so hated by the religious leaders of his day because he kept pointing out their evil and their hypocrisy that they conspired together to kill Jesus. And Jesus allowed it to happen. You see, in, in order for Jesus, who never sinned, never did anything wrong, never did anything worthy of punishment, in order for him to take the, the, a punishment worthy of all the sins of mankind, it had to be brutal, gruesome, as severe as severe can be. And yes, it had to be capital punishment. The, what we earn from sin is death. Somebody had to die in our place. And that's what Jesus did. His punishment included being beaten, being spat on, being mocked, being scourged, whipped on his back, being crucified nailed to a cross, hung there until he died. And all indications are from you know historical records outside of scripture, he was crucified naked, stripped naked for all to see with no possible way to cover himself up in front of his enemies, in front of those who mocked him, that he had to endure that as part of the punishment. That's where we left off, the end of part one. So now Jesus has, has taken our punishment. He's dead. What now? Well, it didn't end there because Jesus, he didn't just take our punishment. He conquered our worst enemy, and that is death. Death is a separation. And he conquered death because on the third day, on the first day of the week that we know is Sunday, God raised Jesus from the dead. He raised him back to life. He proved, Jesus proved, God proved together that there is life beyond death. This is not the end. There's a life beyond it. We don't have time to get in all the scriptures, but the, the picture that we see of death is, okay, let me back up just for a moment. When God created us, we're not just a physical body. The, the story of Adam, he takes dirt and he forms Adam's body, but the man isn't a living being yet. He's just kind of a flesh, uh, flesh and 
blood statue, if you will. God breathes into him the breath of life. In other words, he gives him his spirit, his soul, and then the man became a living being. And death is, you know, death, that I'm not talking about, there's a second death in the Bible, I'm not talking about that one, but the death that we all know and understand and are acquainted with is when our body becomes so broken, it can no longer house our soul, house our spirit. And so our spirit leaves our body. So there's life after death. We continue to exist. And Jesus' resurrection proves that. It, uh, it is also proof of something else. It is to serve his resurrection his return from the dead serves as a sign that God is going to raise all from the dead and that all will be judged. Paul explains this. He was a follower of Christ after spending much of his life persecuting followers of Christ, even assisting in putting some to death, voting that others would be put to death. Eventually, he, Jesus appeared to Paul himself and he became a follower of Christ. He was known as Saul, later became more well-known as Paul. But in Acts chapter 17, he's speaking to the people in Athens, Greece, on Mars Hill. And he explains, and part of it, part of the things he explains is that we're God's offspring. We're God's children. Another thing he explains is that Jesus rising from the dead shows us that all will be raised and all will be judged. Now, a lot of people who heard that made fun of Paul for saying it. I hope you don't have that same reaction. But yes, Jesus is a son to us. Now, some, another important part, huge part of our story, is this right here, the Bible. All these writings that have been collected together in one place for us. These are, there are writings in here that took place hundreds of years before Jesus ever came, and yet they tell us about God's plan to send Jesus and about how Jesus was going to live and die for us. Now, maybe at the, at the end of this podcast, if I, if I see, well, we still have time, I can go back and read some of this, but I'll give you some examples. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel. The people of Israel, they are the physical descendants of Jacob, Abraham's grandson. Abraham had a son named, a man of great faith. God blessed him in many ways. Said through your seed, all nations on earth will be blessed, which in and of itself was a prophecy of Jesus because through Jesus, anybody of any nation can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So God explained it to Abraham, through your seed, through one of your descendants, all nations will be blessed. Abraham had a son named Isaac. God told Isaac the same thing. Isaac had a child named Jacob. Jacob's name was later changed to Israel. His descendants thereafter became known as the Israelites. Jesus, physically speaking, because he was the son of Mary, uh, Mary was an Israelite. She was a, a Jew, a descendant of Jacob, Abraham's grandson. And boy, I spent so much time explaining that. I forgot kind of why I was t telling you all that. But yes, throughout history, God through his prophets said that all these things would happen, that Jesus would come and, and die for us and suffer. So in Deuteronomy 18, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel through whom God had saved them from Egyptian slavery. You may have heard the story of the 10 plagues. That was the Israelites, also known as Hebrews back in that day. Uh, they were slaves in Egypt, and God used 10 plagues to deliver them from the Egyptians. They ran out and, and got to the border of the Red Sea. The Egyptian army came chasing them. God parted the Red Sea. They crossed over on dry ground, and then when the Egyptians tried to do so, God closed the water in on the Egyptians and delivered them. So this same Moses, who God used to lead them out of Egyptian slavery, told them, God is going to raise up for you a prophet like me. Him you shall hear. And this will be that whoever not hear you know, the, the words which he speaks in the name of God, God is going to require it of that person. I'm paraphrasing here. But that's what he says in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. 
fast forward way later. In Acts chapter 3, this is after Jesus died, after he rose from the dead. Now, side point here, what happened after Jesus rose from the dead? For about 40 days, well, for 40 days, he, he would appear on and off to his apostles, to his followers, and he would teach them about God's kingdom. This is in Acts chapter 1. At the end of those 40 days, he ascended right in front of his apostles and other followers. He ascended into heaven, disappeared in the clouds. And as they're trying to peer up into the sky and get glimpses of Jesus, two men in white appeared, indicating they were angels, and told the apostles and the other followers of Christ, you know, why are you standing there looking up into the sky? This Jesus, whom you saw go up into heaven, is going to come back in the same way that you saw him go. So that is a major point to the story of humanity. Jesus is coming back. And so after all that happened, Peter, one of Jesus' 12 special messengers that he chose during his ministry, he had lots of followers, lots of people who said, hey, Jesus, I'm going to follow you and learn your ways. Of those disciples of his, he chose 12 to be his special messengers called apostles. Peter was one of them. And in fact, Jesus did some things with Peter, James, and, and James' brother, John, on a closer level. He worked with them on a closer level than he did the other, the other nine. And so this same Peter is preaching to the people and he references this prophecy of Moses and explains how Jesus was the prophet that Moses was talking about when Moses told the people that God is going to raise up a prophet like me from among your brethren, him you shall hear. So God throughout history has been explaining his story, telling what's going to happen, but it wasn't completely understandable until all the things that were promised would happen actually came to pass How when Jesus fulfilled them. Another example is Isaiah 53, beautiful chapter. Read it if you can. It's about the death of Jesus. Isaiah is talking about it hundreds of years before it ever happened, going into detail not only about Jesus, but how he was suffering for us. He was doing everything he was doing for us, he was taking the punishment for our sins. By his stripes, we talked about how he was scourged. By his stripes, we are healed. That's one of the things Isaiah said. Another thing Isaiah said was that he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. One of the things Jesus didn't do when he was on trial uh, when he was arrested and taken before Pilate the governor, he didn't defend himself. If he had, they would have, there, there's no way anyone was going to beat him. You're not going to beat lawyer Jesus. In fact, during much of his life, he was presented all these difficult questions and thwarted every one of them because the questions were intended to do him harm. You're not going to outsmart the Son of God. Okay, but Jesus chose not to defend himself. He was silent. So again, fast forward to after the life of Jesus, Acts chapter 8, and Philip is told to go to an Ethiopian eunuch, a, a servant of the queen of Ethiopia, a treasurer. And Philip runs up to his chariot and he hears, he hears the Ethiopian reading this passage from Isaiah, but he's, he, he doesn't understand it. He doesn't know about Jesus, so it doesn't make sense to him. And so Philip says, hey, you want me to explain this to you? And, uh, you know, what are you reading? Can, can I help you? And the, the Ethiopian invites him up into his chariot. Yeah, and he see, and Philip sees where he's reading, that he's led his lamb to the slaughter. And from there, he teaches the Ethiopian about Jesus. God provided writings hundreds of years about his son before his son ever came. And he provided writings after his son came. The book of Acts is one of them. And there are letters and there are other things from God, guided by the Holy Spirit, that help us know and understand that all these things are true. That all, and that we can put our trust in these words from God. Because prophecies like that, there's no way for mankind 
to do that on its own. So that was a major, this is a major part of, you know, providing these writings for us, providing his word for us, providing stories of the life of his son for us was a major, is a major part of the work of God with humanity. So thanks to the work of Jesus, now God is offering forgiveness to all. Jesus paid the price. For our sins. So if you want to be forgiven for the things that you've done wrong, now there's a way. Now there's a path. Jesus took your punishment if you want it. If you want to accept that. How do we accept it? How do we receive the forgiveness for the things that we've done wrong, the things we've failed to do right? First, believe. Okay? Believe that God is real. There's no way to please God if you don't believe He. He exists. You know, Hebrews eleven six says, but without faith, it's an impossible to please God. For whoever comes to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Side note, make seeking God, under, make knowing God and understanding him a, the, a extremely high priority of your life. Give it effort, painstaking effort. To understand and know God, that is what he loves. That's what he rewards. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's not just belief in God. We need also to believe in Jesus. Believe that Jesus is God's Son. Believe he died for us. Believe that what we're being told about Jesus is true. So if we want to be forgiven, believe, choose to trust. Now, another thing you'll see, and let me, side note here, whenever Jesus followers, as you read throughout the book of Acts and and beyond, whenever they're talking about being saved, they don't explain it the exact same way every time. They don't use the same phrases every time. Um, This is kind of my compilation of the things that they were teaching. This is the way I normally express it. I break it down into to three things. One, believe. Two, repent. Decide to live in obedience to God and Jesus. That's really all that is. Decide that you're going to follow them. And instead of living by your own ways, it takes time to learn to do that. And God's grace is with us to, to keep forgiving us as we when we mess up, it's okay. We got to learn. We got to grow. Okay? We're not going to master this overnight. In fact, you know, you can live your entire life. You won't master it, but we try and get as close as we can. Um, But yes, just simply decide to live in obedience to them instead of going by your own ways. And then be baptized. Being baptized, it means to be immersed in water, to be immersed in water, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, as instructed by Jesus in Matthew 28. That's one of his last instructions to his disciples. He said, go into all the world and make make disciples of all nations, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who do we baptize? We baptize people who made the decision to follow God, to follow Jesus, to obey them. And so when we do that, beautiful things happen. Beautiful. Can't get into them all. But God washes away our sins. He makes us new. A couple of places you can read that. Matthew 28, Acts 22, uh, verse 16, Romans 6. He makes us new. Our past wrongdoings, gone. Forgive it. Forget it. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the shame. Treat those things as if they never happened. Treat those things as if they're just been blotted out of your life. Those memories blotted out. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the shame. He's forgiven you. Then what, though? Okay, David, I've done this. I'm kind of struggling. What do I do after that? That's fine. Live your life learning to put their ways into practice, especially love. God's highest value, love. What does that mean? Everybody matters to me. I care about everybody. Everybody's important to me. 
from my closest friends and family to my to my deepest darkest enemies to strangers doesn't matter what race you are doesn't matter what gender you are doesn't matter what you've done I value you you matter to me I care about you I love you that's what we learn to do we love God we love Jesus they matter to us and they have to matter to us above all we have to value them above all but then after that we value one another and live our lives learning to love one another. Now, the next major phase in the story of humanity, the next major part that is coming is the return of Jesus. I mentioned it earlier. He is going to come back. We don't know when. Jesus himself didn't know when. He said only God knows when that's going to happen. But at some point, God is going to look at creation. He's going to look at life And he's going to bring it to a close. The Bible teaches that he's going to destroy this world, this this universe by fire. He will replace it, like we said earlier, with something completely new and remove all the evil and suffering and death and pain from it. We are going to receive brand new bodies. Brand new bodies. Indestructible. Uncorruptible. That won't grow old and die. And It's going to be a paradise, but we have to choose to trust him because just like there's, there's reward and relationship with God forever. If we choose to trust him, there is complete separation from our creator and punishment. If we refuse to trust him, if we get to that day of judgment, that day when he's going to raise everybody from the dead, or if we get to the end of our lives and we haven't chose to trust him. We will be eternally separated from him. And there is punishment for that, that from which we'll never recover. Please put your trust in him, in God, in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit. Now, there's one thing I've been convicted about. It's kind of like the Holy Spirit saying, "Uh, hey, you forgot something here. Um, And that is this. You, we give our lives to God in faith, repentance, and baptism. And we talked about, you know, what do I do after that? Yes, we live our lives learning to put their ways into practice, especially love. But we don't do that by ourselves. We don't go it alone unless we just absolutely have to. In Acts chapter 2, those who listened to, to Peter was preaching about how, hey, you crucified the Son of God. And God has made this Jesus whom you killed the Lord. And they asked, well, what do we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. And so those, the people that accepted his word, they repented, they were baptized. And then they, they continued in fellowship with one another. They were with one another daily, eating together, learning the, the, the teachings of the apostles who were giving them the teachings that they had been given by Jesus. And and so they were in close community and fellowship with one another. And you are not created to be alone. You are created to do the same. So seek out other genuine believers in Christ, genuine followers of Christ. You'll know whether they're genuine or not by comparing them to what Jesus teaches us to be versus what they are teaching and or doing. And so, yes, don't do this alone. God doesn't want you to. A, because they can encourage you and be a blessing to you and help you overcome Satan, whom we'll talk about, Lord willing, yeah, next podcast, next video. But then also so that you can be a blessing to them and you can help them as well. You're not meant to do this alone. Thank you for listening. God is with you. He is on your side. Trust him.